I was asked to talk about um, practice changing research in neuroendocrine tumors, both um, the, let's say, recent past and present, and uh, give a little bit of thoughts about, you know, patient role in all of this. Um, so let me just start out with a few definitions, and Josh has already very nicely defined some of these things, but um, we talk about phases in clinical trials. So phase one are early human trials. In other words, the drug looks promising in preclinical, uh, maybe animal studies. And uh, these are typically dose escalation studies, starting at a very low dose and escalating up as tolerable uh, with the primary purpose of evaluating safety and establishing a, a safe dose for subsequent research. Phase two trials are primarily designed to assess the efficacy of the drug. Um, usually it's a single arm study uh, with endpoints such as response rate, meaning tumor shrinkage, or um, time to tumor growth or progression-free survival. Uh, usually these are single arm studies, but occasionally a large phase two study can be, can be randomized. And then phase three are the large typically randomized clinical studies uh, comparing the new drug against either a placebo or a standard of care, uh, usually designed to prove that the drug is superior to either of those things. And typically the goal of a phase three study is to get the drug registered and approved. Um, the most common endpoint in neuroendocrine tumors uh, studies, especially phase three studies, is progression-free survival, meaning basically time until tumor growth. Um, sometimes the endpoint is response rate, meaning the percentage of the patients with significant tumor shrinkage. Overall survival is, is not typically a response rate because um, uh, it would require usually thousands of patients in a randomized trial to be able to prove overall survival benefit, and, and we just don't have these numbers of patients. Uh, but it's often a second secondary endpoint. And then quality of life, and I think Josh uh, described that well. So what are the major trials of the last decade or so? Mo all of you know, know these trials to some extent, so I'll just really go through them very briefly. The two somatostatin analogs, octreotide, sandostatin, lanreotide, somatulene. Uh, those were both proven to inhibit tumor growth in their respective studies. PROMID compared octreotide versus placebo in metastatic midgut nets and showed significant improvement in time to progression. Thyronet looked at uh, lanreotide, somatulene versus uh, placebo, and also showed significant time to tumor growth. So despite the fact that neither drug causes significant tumor shrinkage, they both inhibit tumor growth and were proven on these two phase three studies. Everolimus affinator was investigating the radiant studies. These were radiant two, three, and four were all phase three studies. Uh, radiant two looked at Everolimus plus octreotide versus placebo plus octreotide in patients with progressive neuroendocrine tumors and history of carcinoid syndrome. So mostly mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, this study, even though the curves look a little bit separated, was technically a negative study. The, the difference was not was just short of statistically significant. Uh, Radian-3 looked at Everolimus versus placebo in pancreatic neuron, metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and showed a significant improvement in progression-free survival. And then Radian-4 looked at Patients without history of carcinoid syndrome, non-pancreatic nets, uh, so mostly colorectal, lung, um, some mid-gut, and it also showed a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival. So these were all phase three studies of Everolimus. There was also a phase three study of sunitinib, sutent versus placebo in metastatic pancreatic nets, <clears throat> and that also showed a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival, very similar to, to the Radian-3 study. ECOG 2211 was a randomized phase two study, so almost as large as a phase three, but not quite. There were about 140 patients. Um, it compared capecitabine temozolomide versus temozolomide alone, and it showed a significant improvement in progression-free survival with capecitabine temozolomide. The Netter one was a phase three study looking at lutetium dotatate versus high dose octreotide and showed a very significant improvement in progression free survival that was that was highly statistically significant. And then more recently, there were two Chinese studies looking at serifatinib, one in non pancreatic nets, the other in metastatic pancreatic nets. 
Uh, these were both positive phase three studies showing improvement in progression-free survival, but the drug was not approved um, in the United States and Europe uh, based on mainly on the fact that the studies took place in China and they wanted to see um, multinational studies uh, showing this efficacy. There are two studies that actually were just presented uh, at ESMO last week. Uh, one was the OCLU random study. That was a randomized phase two study looking at lutetium dotatate versus sunitinib in metastatic pancreatic nets. And it showed a very uh, a, a very clear superior progression-free survival with lutetium dotatate versus sunitinib in patients with progressive pancreatic nets. But it was a relatively small phase two study, only 80 patients in total. Uh, the sector study was a, supposed to be a sequencing study looking at uh, everolimus followed by streptozosin 5-FU chemotherapy compared to streptozosin 5-FU followed by everolimus in metastatic pancreatic nets. Um, there were various issues with the trial um, accrual, um, as well as I would say with, with eligibility criteria. Patients did not need to have progressive disease at baseline, and that really, I think, impacted the study. Uh, to the point that there really was no difference between the two arms in terms of progression-free survival, although not surprisingly, there was a higher response rate, meaning tumor shrinkage which strep with the chemotherapy regimen, streptozosin 5-FU. So those are two very recent studies. What about studies in, project in progress? So I want to highlight um, uh, the studies of alpha-emitting PRRT. I think many of you have heard about alpha emitters. Uh, this is a type of peptide receptor radiotherapy with isotopes that in, that that emit um, basically two protons and two neutrons. So a much heavier particle uh, than uh, the previous uh, isotopes, lutetium and yttrium, which which uh, uh, emit beta radiation, which is basically electrons. So it's much higher energy at a much shorter particle range. We're hoping that these drugs uh, result in, a, in in better outcomes and, and, and less less toxicity. So there's two um, isotopes being studied. One is actinium-225. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's the raised bio study. Um, uh, there's a phase one portion, which is taking place now, which will be hopefully followed by a phase three portion where the drug is compared to one of several standard of cares in patients with progressive nets. And then the other study is a single arm phase two study of, of lead 212 dotemtate, um, which is another alpha emitter. Uh, this has two cohorts, one in patients who are naive to PRT. In other words, they've never received lutetium dotemtate or any other PRT. And then there's going to be a cohort of patients who have received lutetium dotemtate. This study is looking primarily at objective response rate or percentage of patients with significant tumor shrinkage. So two studies looking at alpha emitters that are, are quite exciting. Uh, there's also uh, studies looking at lutetium dotatate uh, as an early line of therapy for relatively aggressive grade two or three nets. That's net or two. And then another study looking at lutetium dotatoc, which is very similar, also as an earlier line of therapy. That's the, that's the compose, uh, sorry, that's, that's the um, compose study. There's also the COMPETE study, uh, which is looking at lutetium dotatoc um, uh, versus everolimus in uh, patients with progressive neuroendocrine tumors. That's just completed accrual last month. Another large study is the CABINET study looking at cabozantinib versus placebo uh, in patients with progressive pancreatic as well as non-pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. That's a very large phase three study with two cohorts. Uh, that's looking at this uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, there's a study for uh, liver dominant uh, disease. It's called the RETNET study, looking at gland emboliz hepatic arterial embolization versus chemoembolization. Um, these two embolization modalities have been available for uh, many years, uh, but no one has ever really compared the two. So, this is the first study comparing different types of embolization. And I also want to finally highlight a study of adjuvant case cytobine temozolomide versus placebo in patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that has been resected. Adjuvant means uh, treating patients who have no evidence of disease on scans, but who are thought to have a high likelihood of microscopic disease after surgery. And the point is to 
test whether chemotherapy can eradicate that microscopic disease and either prevent recurrences or delay recurrences. So this is really the first adjuvant study that I'm aware of in, in this field. So Josh has mentioned uh, quality of life, um, which is typically a secondary endpoint in some of these studies, especially the larger studies. There are several widely used metrics, including EORTC, there's the FACG metric, um, there's a there's a less used uh, neuroendocrine um, quality of life, both general questions as to quality of life and overall, overall health, for example, how would you rate your quality of life over the last week? How would you rate your health? Uh, what is your ability to perform normal daily activities like going to work um, or, or do hobbies? And then specific symptom questions like how would you rate your diarrhea or flushing, um, among many other symptoms. Uh, patient reported, reported outcomes are similar, but not necessarily graded on a quality of life scale. They might just simply ask how many times a day do you have diarrhea? or how many times a week do you have flushing or abdominal pain or other symptoms. These are most useful in randomized studies where one can be compared to another, less useful in single arm studies where you could potentially even have just a placebo effect. So to take the Netter 1 study, uh, we looked at various quality of life metrics. Um, <clears throat> and one way of looking at this is comparing time to decline in quality of life. Because despite treatment, there is in most cases, quality of life continues to worsen, although with treatment, it can be slower than without treatment or with a, with a, with a conventional treatment. So in, Netter, in the Netter 1 study, lutetium dotatate was associated with a delay in decline in health, global health, meaning quality of life, physical functioning, meaning ability to perform normal daily activities, role functioning, meaning ability to perform um, hobbies such as, you know, cooking or or, or 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 things like that. Um, and we rely on also on patient reported outcomes such as patient diaries uh, to look at symptoms like abdominal pain, diarrhea and flushing. And you can see in, in these cases abdominal pain and diarrhea, there was a clear benefit with lutetium dotatate versus high dose of triotide, uh, less so with, with flushing. These quality of life questionnaires often ask patients to fill out surveys with multiple questions. Uh, the standard ca EORTC cancer questionnaire has 30 questions. Uh, then there's another 21 that are uh, supposedly looking at, at more net specific questions that comes up to 51 questions. You know, that might be a lot and not all of them are relevant uh, to nets. Uh, so for example, constipation is, is not particularly relevant. Uh, when we looked at the Netter 1 study, we, we ended up looking mostly at a small number of symptoms such as flushing, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bone pain, fatigue, uh, that we felt were relevant to patients with, with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors and, and not using a lot of the questions. So patient input in trial design is increasingly uh, utilized, um, but I just want to point out um, some conflicts between what might benefit the individual patient who's enrolling in a trial versus, let's say, the data or the ability to, to come up with useful data for the general population. So many patients, for example, understandably don't like placebo-controlled studies because there's a chance of being randomized, uh, obviously, to not getting an active drug. That's not great for the patient that's enrolling in the study, but at the same time, it's often uh, the best way of evaluating a new drug and getting it approved quickly. So the most convenient way to look at a new drug is, is to compare it in, a, in patients who have exhausted all standard treatments to no treatment at all. That obviously results in the highest chance of the drug showing benefit and eventually being approved um, for the general population. When you're comparing two active drugs, it takes often a lot more patients being followed over much more time with a lower chance of the drug being shown to be to be active. So when you ask, why do we have placebo-controlled studies? That's the reason. Crossover is another issue. Um, when the endpoint is progression-free survival, we, I, I personally think that crossover should almost always be, be um, um, part of the trial. In other words, patients randomized to placebo. If they progress, they should be allowed to cross over and receive the active drug. Regulatory authorities often 
don't like that. And they sometimes mandate non-crossover because they want to see what impact the drug has on overall survival. So there's a tension there, again, between what's best for the patient enrolling on the trial versus what's, what the regulatory authorities want to see and what's best for, the, for generating uh, a clean trial that, that results in drug approval. Another issue is eligibility criteria. This is a, a big peeve of mine. Um, because we have a lot of trials uh, with a lot of eligibility criteria. And sometimes I feel like there's a lot of copying and pasting going on from other trials with things that are not necessarily relevant. And and when you think about it, it's like running a hurdle. You know, you have to be able to cross over sometimes 20, 30 eligibility criteria. You can end up not being eligible, not for a reason that's actually relevant to to your to the trial being a success or the patient you know, be, uh, being safe, being safely enrolled in a trial, but that's something that's completely irrelevant and nonsensical. So, so to take an example, there are some trials that have nothing to do with blood pressure that, that unfortunately require the patients have a, a perfect blood pressure to enroll. Um, who knows why it was inserted there? Sometimes it was just perhaps copied and pasted from from something else. So, so these are sometimes. Um, reasons why patients may end up not screening for trials. It hurts everyone. It hurts the trial, um, hurts the, the patient who, who really needs to be in a trial. So we need to be very careful about what our eligibility criteria are and, and, and maybe patient input um, can be helpful to hold, hold um, um, investigators and sponsoring company Oh, and there's one more thing I want to point out regarding eligibility criteria. Um, there's there's often a um, a requirement uh, that that the patient not only be eligible at screening but also eligible on day one when they when they enroll in the trial. So just to give an example, this morning I'm dealing with the case of a patient who's screened for a trial, found to be eligible, and today the lab is one of the labs is just slightly off. And now we're scrambling, trying to repeat the lab. I really hope she's eligible, but it would be a really tragedy if she's ends up not being able to enroll in the trial for, for a very trivial lab abnormality. So we, we really need to think about all these things and, 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 and as companies to think about what's really right for the trial and for the patient uh, when it comes to these eligibility criteria. There's also other many other things that we need to consider. Um, um, increasingly, we've um, allowed uh, patients uh, to be monitored on trials on televisits. I think that's a fantastic thing. Uh, many trials require that patients come come to the center or be evaluated very frequently. Uh, clearly, patients don't need to be seen in person for each and every one of these visits. So trials can be extremely burdensome. Televisits are one way of, of alleviating that burden. And... Um, I really hope that this continues. Uh, you know, there, there have been efforts to reverse this now that the uh, pandemic is abating a little bit. I really hope that we get to, to continue monitoring patients on, 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 on Zoom and other, other televisit modalities. Um, you know, also, we really need to consider the number of labs, EKGs, monitors, PK testings, you know, safety visits, a lot of this stuff is above and beyond uh, what's required, I think, for, for patient safety and trial data. So, so I think uh, we need to look carefully at what we're demanding of patients. And, and I think, you know, patients uh, uh, groups can, can also look into these trials and provide input and ask, you know, what's really necessary and what's, what's extraneous. What about areas of need? Um, we clearly need studies for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. That's 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 a, an area where we haven't really made much progress in the last, you know, three or four decades. Um, I'm happy to say that I'm, we're increasingly seeing studies in this area, uh, but we really need more. Um, I'd like to see more cell therapy studies, um, uh, things like CAR T studies. Uh, by specific uh, antibodies, T cell engagers. You know, we we're, we're, we we see a lot of studies with very similar tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, things that are not that novel, um, and we really need novel 
drugs and and you know cell therapies are really one area where there's 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 the potential to um potential for long-term remission uh not just uh not just controlling disease for for a short period of time it's it's a long shot obviously when we're talking about completely new therapies um, but we're working uh, preclinically on developing uh, CAR T cells that are targeting the somatostatin receptor, as well as bispecific antibodies, and and others are working that on that as well. And hopefully, we're going to see some clinical trials in the in the in the near future.